These boots are made for walking And that's just what they'll do One of these days these boots are gonna walk all over you As a fan of narrative-heavy games, there is one term that I encountered a lot in the video game discussion in the past decade or so. Walking simulators. Games with no mechanics where you do nothing but walk, and therefore can hardly be called video games. And it seems like a very... well, loaded kind of tag, isn't it? For example, Pathologic. I've never seen anyone but myself describe that game as a walking sim, despite the fact that traversing the town on Gorkon is the biggest part of the game's gameplay. You need to talk to someone? Walk. You need to get some food? Walk. Sure, there are some obstacles on the way, like people with knives or a deadly plague that you need to dodge, but ultimately that game is little more than walking, gameplay-wise. Or how about point-and-click adventures? There is usually very little interaction to speak of with them, maybe a puzzle here and then, and these are usually the most disliked parts of the genre due to how ridiculous and non-intuitive they got. Are these walking simulators? Should they turn into one, considering what low regard their gameplay is commonly held in? But I don't ever see the term discussed in those terms. And as it was often attached to games I had no interest in, I never really thought much about it. But no more. Let's take a walk through the concept of a casual stroll game, and, perhaps more importantly, why the term became so cursedly popular. Because even if the quality that makes those titles disinteresting is misjudged, the common reaction is something worthy of discussing. Granted, by the nature of my approach, I'm ignoring the possibility of the arguments being made in bad faith, as these are not worth talking about in the first place. I think there are legitimate grievances mixed into the pop-cultural mosh of complaining that is the internet. So, let's get to it. I think the initial mistake people make is equating mechanics with combat because of how prevalent the latter is in video games. Exploration by itself is a game mechanic, finding a way to places you could see from the distance but not initially reach, searching every nook and cranny for items, applying spatial knowledge to find a hidden room because you know there should be more space than what you explored in a building. It's all fun stuff. We know it's fun stuff, there's a reason why open world games are so endlessly popular in the mainstream crowd. And there's plenty of games with a non-combat focus out there, my favorite probably being the entire genre of city builders. Like, some of them have combat, but it's always the worst part of them that I would gladly cut out. And I don't think I've ever heard of these games getting shit for being not combat focused, so clearly that is not the end all of the discussion. The public can accept games without a combat focus and not get their panties in a twist about them. Hell, for a more character focused example, just look at the success of Disco Elysium in the past few years. So if games with good exploration are so well liked, why are games that seemingly focus on nothing but exploration get so much shit? I'd like to invoke a personal example. I think the closest I ever got to the feeling of absolute disinterest of wow, nothing is happening, that is often attributed to the genre of walking simulators, is Quantic Dream slash David Cage games. So, most recently Detroit. And at first, it seems like a complete mismatch. A lot happens in that game, there's events you react to, button props, dialogue trees. But there is a really strong disconnect between you and what is happening on the screen, because none of the buttons mean anything. Sometimes you get a much square to do a physical task. At other times, it's triangle. At no point is there any consistency to let you internalize any of the button presses as you, the player, actually doing something. It's just meaninglessly responding to stimuli given to you on a screen, a game of Simon Says. Which, ironically, was exactly the way Fahrenheit, another game by the same studio, contextualized action scenes. And it was just as unsatisfying, drawing your attention away from the action on the screen and not giving you any kind of feeling of accomplishment in return. Which is quite ironic, as the same game also had a genuinely clever implementation of a real-life problem as a gameplay mechanic. In a certain scene you play as a claustrophobic detective that has to go through tight spaces to solve a case, like a case archive that is just 
packed with movable metal bookshelves. And to deal with the anxiety, the game has you mimicking other real coping mechanism. Breathe in, breathe out. It's contextualized through this little bar here, asking you to keep it centered at all times. And it pops up enough times to even get a small twist as you have to stop breathing to not make your presence known to the... Uh, violently insane people in the SR. Look, I look the mechanic is cool, not the game, okay? Point is, it's not the existence or not of complex mechanics that makes or breaks the feeling of playing a game, it's the internalization of mechanics, even simple ones. There needs to be a step of contextualizing the clicks and clacks of pressing buttons as taking action, at least in your brain. Even if games focused on combat, there is a qualitative difference between knowing deep within your soul that pressing X will make your character swing a sword and reading a prompt that says press random button to swing the sword every time there is a fight scene. One is playing a game, the other is pressing next behind some smoke and mirrors. But it's not even about the degree of interactivity. I think we can all agree that Hideo Kojima wants nothing more than to make 20 hours long movies. But even so, Metal Gear Solid 3 has been one of the most influential and cool games of all time. And it's not just by merits of story content within its hours of cutscenes, which can get silly and eye roll at times, or the gameplay, which was absolute hell before they changed how the camera works in the re-release, but also because of how clever that game is. Just full of tiny bullshit details that make the game feel so much more real. You can blow up a food supply room to make the enemy soldiers go hungry. You can shoot a boss with a sniper rifle right after a cutscene in which he appears to skip the fight entirely. You can look at the world from a first-person perspective at any moment and your field of vision narrows after Snake loses an eye. A lot of really, really cool stuff that makes you get deeper into the fantasy of the world. Look at this fictional playground and think how you can use the tools given to you to more effect. Even things as simple as the button that lets you change the point of view of the character. There is this feeling that, as silly and over the top as it can get, the world of Metal Gear Solid 3 is real because of all that reactivity. And every time a non-standard use of a mechanic is acknowledged by the game as viable, that pushes these mechanics even deeper into your brain and makes you think of any other ways they could be used. It's the polar opposite of the surface level press X for think prompt. This, combined with the pathologic bit I mentioned at the beginning, leads me to believe that the issue boils down to immersion. Not just in the sense of wow, this game makes you feel like Batman, but just the depth at which you think about the world and story presented to you. If something keeps taking you out of the experience, like for example the fact you can't internalize any of the game's rules because there are none, so for example every button prompt takes you out of it, it brings your mind back to the surface level thought of, oh yeah, I guess I am looking at things on a screen. But I keep holding onto my French example of Detroit like that's the primary villain here, but it isn't. So what is the point of contention that keeps people from engaging deeply enough with, say, Gun Home or Everybody Has Gone to the Rapture, which are probably the two most infamous walking sims? That answer is quite simple, the story has already happened and doesn't relate to what you're doing in any way or form. Stories that already happened and make you deal with the aftermath are not uncommon in video games. You need to look no further than Dark Souls. All events of importance are in the past and you walk through the broken remains of what the world used to be, only learning about them after the fact. But the key phrase here is dealing with the aftermath. The events of the past inform the present that you play in. Why is this person so screwed up? Why does this item exist? Why does everyone try to kill me and take my lunch money? There is engagement in the gameplay, stuff that you interact with even if at first you have no idea why. By contrast, the entire story in something like Gun Home is already said and done. You piece together what happened and that's it. It's like minding your business when strolling through a city, seeing an old building and walking up to read a plague to inform you about why that structure is there. It might be cool, but it's not exactly interaction and it doesn't have any influence on your life after that point. It's just a bit of trivia. Environmental storytelling and audiologues have been staples of video games ever since the first System Shock, 
long enough to be ridiculed and declared cliché. But, as all clichés, they became so ever-present because they worked. On a rather basic level, the combination of the two shows and tells. You get to see the situation as it is and listen to an explanation, often in parts, of how the people involved got there. So it is not a stretch by any means to create a relatively low-budget game relying purely on those elements. People like them, so why not create something valuable out of just those good parts? Well, as it turns out, hearing a story secondhand does not really fly in the day and age of instant access to countless works of fiction that show events of a story framed as if they were parallel to the audience's own existence, not to mention those that give them a chance to interact with them in a meaningful way. Giving past context for events unfolding now is inherently different from just giving the past context and then leaving you to fiddle your thumbs. The former is storytelling. The latter is a guided tour for a museum, and there is not much point to a museum of a world other than the one you inherit. Of course, you can make a non-violent game about down-to-earth themes and relatable struggles, but you have to make something with it, for lack of a better phrase. Planescape Torment came out over 20 years ago, and nobody praises that game for its mechanics, but for the tale of a man coming to terms with his own past sins. Even then, these revelations about the Nameless One's past are valuable because they recontextualize how you approach the story in its relative present, how you see your companions or other characters that you surely hurt in the past. It asks how you would approach such a situation if you were to find yourself in it, Surely, in a much less fantastical setup, but still, it is not a far reach to imagine a situation where you can learn that you hurt someone in the past and don't even recall it, not to mention you consider yourself to be a different person from who you used to be at that moment. You could cut out all the combat, all the gameplay from that title, and it would be just like those reviled walking simulators. But I suspect it would still be held in a high regard because of how it asks these questions and gives you the space to examine them and provide an answer. Imagine Torment if it was nothing but a diorama of flashbacks, a man realizing too late about all the hurt he's inflicted. All alone, unable to make amends, only ever seeing past flashes of people but never able to actually talk to them. Not only is it sad, it seems like pointless rumination. And there's only so many stories you can tell when you deny the characters any sort of agency. And that is exactly what these so-called walking sims are. Stories set in stone the second you turn them on, not even willing to bring up the effort to peddle you the illusion of the events unfolding before your very eyes. I don't mind games lacking in gameplay. I don't know if you noticed, but my channel icon is a character from a visual novel. And I don't think I would love said visual novel nearly as much if it was nothing but Jill looking into a mirror and recounting her life's woes and regrets. The fact that the events of the story unfold in what is, to her, real time makes it valuable and relatable, even if I know where it is heading because it's the third time I'm playing this damn thing. A person, even a fictional one, is so much more in a single moment of their life than a list of events of their past, even if the latter informs and influences the former. I am, for lack of a better term, alive. I can change myself, be it for better or worse, and I can change the world around me in similar ways. What interest do I have in tales of the dead who don't have that privilege? If a story cannot break itself to make itself alive as I read it, what value does it have over its own synopsis? What sense is there to giving a story a frame in time and space, and saying everything of actual importance happens in a different spatio-temporal spot of existence? Why did you bring me here, if you only were to tell me my presence was of no importance? And don't tell me that having to strike a pose to hear the story counts as me having importance here. We both know this isn't true. So, dear author, why am I here? I feel like this got dark towards the end. Did it get dark? Yeah, anyway. I'm hoping to finish a game to have something substantial to talk about soon, but how long to beat does not fill me with optimism. So get ready for some general topics and whatever else catches my interest in the meantime. As always, huge thanks to my Patreon supporters, now visible on the screen. If you can, please consider joining them. If you can't, but you still like the video, 
Word of mouth goes a long way on the YouTube Nobody Market. See you next time. Ta-da!